Good morning, I'm Peter Cowan. After a 10-week rocky campaign and a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're half an hour away from finding out who won this election. This is Newfoundland and Labrador Votes 2021. She accepted my request to dissolve the House of Assembly for an election across Newfoundland and Labrador on Saturday, February 13th. That was the plan, but COVID had other ideas. Just days away from Election Day, everything changed. We have 100 new cases of COVID-19 in our province. We would have to shut down in-person voting for the rest of the election. Election workers walked away and the province went into a full lockdown. The election moved to mail-in voting only, and then there was delay after delay after delay. That four-week campaign has now stretched into 10, with plenty of complaints about the new process. My name was printed on it, but it said St. John's Centre underneath it, instead of Waterford Valley. How many other people around here has this happened to? The goal for the man who called it is still the same. Andrew Fury and his Liberal Party want a majority. The PCs and NDP have different ideas. We need the right team with a mandate from the people of this province to be bold today for where we will go tomorrow. Andrew Fury says sometimes you have to cut off a leg to save a patient. I'd want my doctor to tell me if he plans to cut off my limbs before I have an amputation. You can't cut your way to a solid foundation. Now, the votes are counted and we'll find out whether Andrew Fury gets the majority mandate he's seeking or if voters want a change in government. But with all the changes, will the parties or the voters accept the results? It's always uh, troubling when you hear things uh, that are outside the, the norm, but uh, I understand Elections NL is handling it now in an open and transparent way. There is much that could be disputed in a court of law, that is for sure. An election like this one can never happen again. This election is happening, and it's happening right here on CBC. Welcome to viewers and listeners across Newfoundland and Labrador, joining us on radio, TV, and online, and from folks across the country watching on CBC News Network. Everyone keeps saying this race has been historic, it's been unprecedented. After a 69-day campaign, it's almost over. The final ballots were handed in Thursday at 4 p.m., and we're now just 27 minutes away. We've got that countdown clock on the bottom of the screen if you're watching us to uh, count down the minutes until we start getting those results and when we find out who will be leading Newfoundland and Labrador. Unlike other elections where the results trickle in, these will be total and final results, all expected all at once. So very quickly, we will know who's won and who's lost. My co-host this morning is Carolyn Stokes. Over the next half hour, we're going to look at how we ended up with such a long and chaotic election campaign and talk about the big challenges facing whoever forms government. Carolyn, before we get to it, what are you going to be watching for this afternoon? Well, I think the big question today will be, will Andrew Fury secure that majority that he's been looking for? The whole reason for this election to begin with. Also, I'll be curious to see voter turnout. We already know that it's going to be the lowest in history. So that's the best case scenario, around 50%. So going to be wondering where that lands in the end because it's probably a topic we're going to hear about going forward as people use that number perhaps to question the legitimacy of this election. And uh, also, Peter, I'm going to be wondering how smoothly this goes. This has been a very chaotic election. We're about to do something that hasn't been done before, dropping all of these results at noon and in an election that has been riddled with problems. I'm just curious to see how this is going to go. I just hope it goes smoothly, yes, Carolyn. Yes, me too. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, it will be interesting to see, uh, especially as we start getting those results and seeing what happens. Of course, watching the results closely are going to be the Liberals. Terry Roberts is at Liberal headquarters with us this morning, where it's a very different scene, Terry. Yes, there's a ballroom. Yes, there's lots of signs, but you're kind of missing a lot the normal supporters that we'd expect to see at an event like this. Well, this is different, Peter. I'm here at uh, Salon E at the Delta Hotel. I'm guessing we're uh, in a room about uh, 2,000 square feet. 
Uh, ordinarily, for an event like this, the governing party are looking to uh, uh, win an election, you'd be in a, a room perhaps, perhaps 10,000 square feet with hundreds of people. But we're in a pandemic, and there's a maximum of 50 people here. There's probably a dozen in the members of the media. There are Liberal Party officials here. And beyond that, it's just Andrew Fury and his family. So what I'm hearing is that he'll be here around 12.30 to uh, make a speech. He'll be introduced by uh, uh, campaign uh, co-chair Judy Morrow. He'll speak for about seven minutes. Then the media will get to question him. He'll do some interviews. Uh, so, and beyond that, I just ran into him out in the hallway here. He was in to have a look at this room. I said, uh, Mr. Fury, one word, how are you feeling? He said, nervous. Peter? Okay, well, in 24 minutes, we'll find out whether or not he should be nervous or should be happy. But let's go to the PCs now. The party is not having an event today, perhaps an ominous sign. So our reporter Mark Quinn is in the newsroom and following the campaign. So how are we expecting to hear from Chess Crosby if we don't have an event like the other parties do? Right, this is a weird day all around. It's been a weird election. Uh, my day's even weirder than uh, Terry's in a way. I'm not even in a headquarters, I'm in the newsroom. But uh, Chess Cross has been very combative, and the PCs have been very combative through this whole election. Uh, it's a bit strange that he's not going to be available, we're hearing. It's unlikely he'll be available during this broadcast and during the uh, live uh, rolling out of all the uh, results. We're hearing he's going to release a video, uh, and he probably will release it by Twitter, and we'll make sure that the viewers get that. But it is an unusual thing. Uh, it makes us wonder what the future holds for Chess Crosby. Uh, we'd love to ask him that. It's the obvious question right now. Uh, who will be the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party after this election? Uh, we'll have to wait and see what his video says. Well, and maybe if he ends up with a minority or even a majority government, he'll regret not uh, being there to bask in that moment. We'll all see how it goes down because we are now 23 minutes away from those results. And let's head to the NDP. They are having an event today. Heather Gillis is with the party at a hotel in downtown St. John. So, Heather, what does a win look like for the party today? Well, Peter, five seats is the high watermark for the NDP. When the legislature dissolved, they had three seats. So anywhere between five to three is what success looks like for the NDP today. Uh, so what you're going to be watching out for is leader Alison Coffin in St. John's East, Kitty Vitti, Jim Din in St. John's Centre, and uh, Jordan Brown in Labrador West. And, and that's really one to watch because in 2019, that district uh, was won by two votes when it came down to a judicial recount. And of course, since the beginning of this election, the NDP has been questioning the timing in the winter in a pandemic. And they've also been raising questions about the ballot since we moved into this mail-in ballot system about accessibility, getting them to and from Labrador, things like translation, people not getting ballots, people not being able to return their ballots on time. And as late as yesterday, they were talking about um, scrutinizing the ballots and that process as well. Why is that important? Well, it's important for them because of that judicial recount. Uh, and like Terry said, uh, here in a ballroom with uh, just actually our media colleagues right now with about eight or ten uh, candidates uh, out in the hall everybody waiting so uh, not your traditional election format feeling a little weird for everyone it's a weird election for absolutely everyone and i don't think anything feels normal about this we are now 21 minutes away from getting the results and of course we were supposed to have all these results six weeks ago but a covid 19 outbreak with the highly contagious variant b117 derailed all of that our reporter garrett berry explains how it all unfolded where to start with this sideways election campaign. It began as usual with that ceremonial walk to the Lieutenant Governor's house. Beautiful day. For weeks, there was no controversy in sight, with the Liberals sporting a comfortable lead and the opposition far behind. Then... The outbreak in the metro area is indeed due to a COVID-19 variant of concern. The election was upended. A COVID-19 outbreak that ramped up case numbers and ramped up questions about how safe the process was and how it would work. Which, which to be quite frank, Mr. Premier, are very serious questions I understand. as well, which is why yeah. it's important for journalists to ask them. No, I, 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 t I totally understand, but we don't have the answers. Behind the scenes, a mini-revolt was brewing. Election officers began to quit and mayors stepped in to shut down community polling stations. Then another blow. A late press conference on a Friday night at the same time that health officials were announcing a province-wide lockdown. I'm introducing special measures orders across the province. The chief electoral officer appeared on the national Shut news. 
pulling the plug on in-person voting that was set to start the next morning. Basically transition off to the special ballot. It only got weirder from there. Along came another extension and another. Timelines were changed five times. Time ticked on, making this the longest provincial election since Confederation, by far. And the complications continued, with the switch to mail-in voting serious questions about ballot access. Many in rural Labrador worried they'd be left behind. As soon as you get your ballot, get it back in the mail as fast as you can. Even now, questions continue to crop up. This week, new revelations that some voted by telephone, though legally, that's not allowed. This whole thing has become a shambles. So that's why we're here on a Saturday morning, six weeks after what was supposed to be election day, still waiting to find out who won. And more than that, where this province goes from here. Garrett Perry, CBC News, Gander. Well, the delays and the voter problems all point to a low voter turnout. In fact, we know that if everyone who requested a special ballot sent it back and it was counted, voter turnout would be a record low at around 50 percent. Let's bring in Amanda Bittner. She's a political scientist at Memorial University in St. John's. So, Amanda, you watch elections for a living. So I, I want to know, what are you going to be looking for as we see these results come in in about uh, 19 minutes from now? <laughs> I mean, you don't need an expert for me to tell you that this is a highly irregular election. Um, I do think, though, that despite all the irregularities, um, the eternal optimist in me wants to think that this is an opportunity for us to re-examine how we run elections in this province in particular, but also elsewhere. Um, we can fix things. Obviously, they're broken, um, but uh, we can potentially make them a bit better. And it might be actually a chance for us to improve things and not just to fix the actual problems that we have, but to actually be a leader and to sort of, you know, move things forward across the country and demonstrate that we can make elections more democratic if we try. Um, and there are some things that we could do to improve things that, you know, have become extremely clear over the last, whatever, a thousand weeks of this election campaign. Amanda, what does this say that we're talking about the process of voting rather than talking about the parties, their platforms, and what they plan to do if and when they win? Yeah, it's certainly suboptimal, um, normally in an election. So if we think about the kind of traditional functions of elections, the purpose of them is to, yes, choose a government, to hold governments accountable. Um, so we're doing that, sort of. People aren't really voting, so that's a problem. Um, but it also bestows legitimacy on the government that you choose in theory. Um, and then also the really important ones from my point of view, in addition to those, are educating the public, mobilizing the public, giving the public a chance to have a de debate, discussion, dialogue, and get us energized about the issues of, of the day in the, in the place that we live. Uh, and unfortunately, we haven't talked about that. We have some major issues here that aren't just pandemic related and aren't just, you know, nuts and bolts of elections related. And we haven't really talked about any of those things. And it's a real shame. It's a lost opportunity for sure. Well, thank you for sharing your insights. We'll see what the leaders have to say about some of those topics when we hear from them later on. We are now just 17 minutes away from getting results. One of the issues raised with mail-in only voting is accessibility. We've heard from some voters who applied for ballots and never got them. That raises the question of just how accessible this election has been. Carolyn's next guest joins us to talk about that. Laura Belmba is with the St. John's Status of Women Council. We first heard from her early in the election campaign when she was calling for more diversity within the provincial government. Now, since the election delay, she's been looking at the issue of accessibility in this makeshift voting process. She joins me right now. Ms. Zimba, uh, we've been hearing from people who felt left out in this election campaign because of accessibility issues. What do you make of how the process unfolded? I am disappointed with how the process unfolded. There was a lot of uncertainty as to one, whether the election will hold and when it was decided the election would still stand as to how people would be allowed to express their right to vote. We had a while where we were thinking people were going to do drive through voting, which put people who did not have a car at as a disadvantage. And then when it came to the decision to do special ballots, you had to apply for those online, which put people with unstable internet, people who weren't comfortable using the computer at a disadvantage. And then we had people who in Labrador were getting their postmarked um, election slips late. And then we had to send them back to make sure they were time there in time. People were getting incomplete slips. I just think the way it was put together was a little bit disheartening for those who wanted to express their right to vote. 
You know, much of the focus has been on the voting process and all of the chaos in this election campaign. A lot of the issues have dropped off the radar. Where would you like to see the focus shifted now? I would like to see that they kind of focus back on the issues that people had prior to the election. When the election was originally called, people were looking at, we were talking about racism, we were talking about access to healthcare, our employment system, our environment, and just these were just basic issues that were needed to be addressed prior to the way our election process rolled out and our voting process rolled out. So whoever gets elected into power, it will be important that they sit with the citizens of Milan Labrador and kind of see where we stand, see what issues we're facing and how they plan to address them. Because we're a very diverse population within this province, and it's time that all the issues that are important to the citizens come to light. Laura Belumba, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. While we wait to see those results, just 14 minutes away now, let's bring in our political veterans. They're going to be joining us throughout this broadcast as we break down the results. And I think this is one election that they're all glad that they're not candidates in. Jerry Rogers is a former NDP leader, nodding there in agreement with that statement. Sandy Collins was a PC cabinet minister. And Colin Holloway served as a Liberal MHA and Parliamentary Secretary. So I just briefly want to get from each of you who has the most at stake in today's election results? Jerry, let's start with you. I, I think, uh, Peter, I think that for sure it's Andrew Fury. And Andrew Fury was desperate. He told us that he had to get a mandate to go forward. And it will be interesting to see how many people actually were able to cast their ballots. So what percentage, if, if he were to win, what percentage would he have? And would that be that valid, that valid mandate? What really will constitute a, 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 a very definitive uh, mandate for him? Um, you know, this has been a, a mad hatter tea party type of election. And uh, it, it, it ain't over. I do not believe this is over today. Okay, that's not an optimistic forecast. <laughs> Colin Holloway, what about you? Where do you think the, uh, the real pressure is on this afternoon? Well, I'd agree with Jerry uh, that uh, the biggest pressure is on Andrew Fury. Uh, just think back now what kind of year he's had. Uh, he came in after Dwight Ball, previous premier, was forced out by members of his own caucus and cabinet. So Andrew immediately had to uh, get into a leadership race against John Habit. Uh, then, you know, that was in, in August, so he was successful in being the leader. Uh, but then he had to go into uh, uh, another race for the district for a Humber Gross born back in, in October. So it seems like Andrew Fury has been in election mode ever since he's uh, decided to put his hat into the ring. And here we are now into, uh, you know, middle of, a, or I guess we're coming to the end of a pandemic uh, in, in the winter in Newfoundland and Labrador, which is challenging of itself. Uh, but Jerry's right. I mean, Andrew Fury has said that he he had the mandate of the party, he had the mandate of the district, he needed the mandate of the people. And we can't forget the Green Report. We know this province has some significant debt, and the Green Report is supposed to give some recommendations to government on how to address that. So, you know, Andrew came into this election with barely uh, a minority government. He needs a stronger mandate than that if he's going to bring in any change that's going to right the financial woes of this province. Sandy Collins, the PCs, though, have a lot on the line with this election as well, especially for Chess Crosby. H how important is the result for him? I think it's uh, do or die time for Chess right now. Um, this is his second general election. He wasn't obviously able to secure a government the last election. I think this would be the final uh, final straw here if, uh, if he weren't able to to gain government. Uh, but, you know, the more I think about it, obviously, Andrew Fury has already taken quite a, a brunt with 23 points dropping in the polls since this uh, writ has been dropped. But at the end of the day, I think first and foremost, the people in Newfoundland and Labrador have the most at stake. They're into an expensive, mismanaged election that had restricted access. And I'm wondering how they will accept the legitimacy of this vote. And this may be just the beginning as opposed to the end. So um, I think we ourselves, the taxpayers, the people of this province has, have the most at stake clearly. Well, thanks for joining us and stay with us because we're going to come back to you for more of your insights as we start seeing some of those results come in. 
Well, one thing we do know for certain today is that whatever party forms the next government will have a monumental task ahead. Find ways to bring the province's finances back from the brink. It's often a battle, so let's have a look back at how past governments tried to balance the books. Financially, government must act in a way very similar to individuals. If income drops, expenses must be cut. It's a tough balancing act for many past premiers, including Brian Peckford. In the 1980s, he looked for ways to cut government spending in the cash-strapped province. What do we want? He chose to freeze the wages of public sector workers. Newfoundland's Premier Brian Peckford has made about 50,000 people very angry. The freeze affected nurses, teachers, police, firefighters and doctors, all government employees. He has set the stage for several years of labor strife in this province. The wage freeze and a dispute over wage parity triggered an epic illegal strike that brought public services to a standstill. The strike grew in size and ferocity. There were clashes with police, dozens arrested. The tail has wagged the dog for the last six months, and the dog is going to bark back. It's almost neo-fascist behavior that this government's been carrying on to this point. The confrontations finally ended, and after a decade in office, Peckford resigned with an ominous admission. I don't think I have the necessary ruthlessness to do what really has to be done. Enter the Wells government and the 1990s with the same sorry state of finances. Mr. Speaker, this is a severe budget. A deep recession, cuts in federal transfer payments and looming financial catastrophe, Clyde Wells called for sacrifice. Just as public employees have benefited from economic growth in the province, government has no choice but to ask those same employees to share the burden during the difficult periods. Thousands of government jobs lost, a freeze on all public service salaries, hundreds of hospital beds closing, all to help turn around the province's dismal financial picture. Steady. Familiar faces assumed a familiar fighting stance. What they've done is declared war on the labor movement. We have to take the political heat for the decisions that we, we make. Claims of broken campaign promises led to a catchy but loaded refrain. Wells enraged teachers by looking to their pension plan for savings and again, familiar scenes of anger on the steps of Confederation Building. Despite all the cuts and personal attacks, Wells campaigned on austerity and found support in the electorate winning an increased majority. He tabled the first balanced budget in the province's history. We see an increasing number of nurses losing full-time positions for part-time positions. Liberal rule continued under Premier Brian Tobin and so did the financial problems. In 1999, thousands of the province's nurses went on strike, demanding increased pay and decreased workloads. Nurses took the fight to Confederation Building. Their picket signs damaged the marble floors and led to a ban of protests inside the lobby of the legislature. Tobin ended the week-long strike, legislating the nurses back to work. ready to do your part in building a stronger and a more prosperous Newfoundland and Labrador. Enter Danny Williams in 2003 and another government battle with the unions over the province's finances. Williams' attempt to eliminate 4,000 jobs, cut spending and freeze wages led to a month-long strike of 20,000 public sector employees. The fight once again got personal. Williams warned union members to stay away from family members or they would be out, as they he put it. Till the cows come home. Welcome to day 20th. 
in the biggest strike in the history of Newfoundland and Labrador. By day 28, Williams would resort to legislating the workers back to their jobs. Step one is to clean up the mess that was left by this yeah, previous yeah. administration. That's plan one. That's step one. Hey, hey, oh, hey. Oh, hey. And then five years ago, another case of deja vu, another budget shocker. A massive drop in oil revenues meant Liberal Premier Dwight Ball introduced austerity measures. Everybody's sick and tired of this government, the levy, the taxes, and all this stuff. Dwight trapped the ball! A budget of higher taxes and fees, a new income-based levy, increased tax on gasoline, a plan to close libraries, all led to a fierce okay. public get backlash. And get with the f program, okay? This is not a union issue, but it's an issue that has unified each and every one of us in this province. Intense public pressure eventually led to a scaling back of some cuts, including scrapping the plan to close libraries. Beautiful day. All bringing us to today and another fiscal nightmare for the province. Some say it's the worst ever. Whichever leader is handed the Premier's baton today will also earn their place in history for the decisions they make as they walk the same fiscal tightrope over a watchful public who's poised to pounce if they fall. And in less than four minutes, we should find out who is going to be that leader who has to bring the province through these difficult times. And let me explain some of the graphics that you're going to see if you're watching us on TV. At the bottom of your screen, we've got the numbers. Right now, they're all zeros because we don't have any results yet. But we are expecting in less than three, in about three minutes, that numbers are going to come in and we will see final results right away. One number to keep in mind is 21. That's how many seats any party needs in order to get a majority. So that's one of the numbers we'll be looking for at the bottom of our screen. All right, so let's have a look at uh, some of the districts to watch, uh, starting with Lake Melville. The question here is, will Perry Trimper be able to pull off a win as an independent? He was a liberal former environment minister and House speaker who stepped away from the party because of racist comments he made on two occasions about the Labrador Inno. So PC opponent Shannon Tobin works for the band council. So could Tobin benefit from a split vote between uh, liberal supporters between Michelle Baker? and Perry Trimper. Next uh, district to watch, Bonavista. There's a rematch happening here be between PC incumbent Craig Party and independent Neil King. Now, King was the liberal MHA there between 2015 and 2019 when he lost to Party. So King wanted to run again as a liberal but was rejected by the party because of comments he made on social media. Now, Placentia St. Mary's liberal incumbent Sherry Gammon Walsh was removed from cabinet over allegations she leaked cabinet secrets. There was a police investigation. She wasn't charged, but she also wasn't welcomed back into the cabinet. And she faces some pretty strong opposition in PC candidate Calvin Manning, who's the brother of well-known politician Fabian Manning. And lastly, Labrador West, Jordan Brown barely won his seat last time. There was a two vote difference. And Nick McGraw, former transportation minister, is looking to make a comeback. It's been a while since he's been in politics. He had to resign in 2014 for his part in the Humber Valley paving fiasco. So will he be able to win back the seat after being out of the political spotlight for about six years? Interesting. And Carolyn's going to have lots of results for us as they come in because the fun doesn't stop after we find out who forms government. We're going to dig into some of those results and tell you about some of the interesting stories that we're going to see. But just as a reminder, we are less, we are just one minute and 10 seconds away from 12 o'clock Newfoundland time and getting those results. Let's show you what it looks like uh, across Newfoundland and Labrador after the last election. This is the map of the province, or at least it was as of 2019. We are going to find out in just a minute how this map is going to change. The Liberals had a minority government. They went to the polls hoping to turn this into a majority. They're looking to change some of those blue and orange seats that we're seeing across the map into red ones today. Will they be able to do it? The votes have all been tallied. They've been cast 
and we are going to find out in just uh, um, thir less than 30 seconds now yeah. how this map is going to change. Many anxious candidates out there for sure. It's been a long campaign, especially for the newcomers. Uh, so I'm sure <laughs> they signed up for a four week campaign. What they got was 10, ten weeks. weeks away from their jobs. And we are just seconds away from those results. So don't go anywhere. This is Newfoundland and Labrador votes. I'm Peter Cowan here in the studio. It is now 12 o'clock, 11.30 Newfoundland time. And normally this would be the time that we are saying polls have closed, but uh, this isn't a normal election by any stretch of the imagination. So this is the time that elections Newfoundland and Labrador has said they are going to release those results from this election. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, a very interesting election, really two tiers of uh, voters here. We have the voters who voted in the advance polling, and we also have the voters that uh, voted after uh, the, the election was changed into a mail-in uh, only election uh, after the outbreak. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, and we aren't able to actually break down, at least not right away, mm -hmm. what were the votes like before the pandemic second wave, and what have the votes been like with this second part and those mail-in ballots. Uh, so in the future, I know a lot of people are going to be curious to see kind of how things changed, especially because Andrew Fury faced a lot of criticism over what was largely out of his control. Once he set this, the wheels in motion on this election campaign, he wasn't able to control anything around the second wave of the pandemic, but a lot of people, it, it was seen as kind of a judgment on him mm -hmm. that you know, as those, uh, you know, seeing that a pandemic election created all sorts of uncertainty, created problems, people weren't able to vote. It was elections Newfoundland and Labrador running the show, uh, but we will find out as we see those results how much things have changed. Because if you remember, Carolyn, when we started this campaign, he was polling at above 60%. Those are the sort of numbers that every leader dreams of. And that surely factored into his decision to go to the polls. And also at the time, we had very few cases of COVID in the province. It, uh, it you know, scattered case here and there. And uh, then, bam, we were hit with that outbreak that just really changed the landscape. It changed the tone. It changed the process of this entire election. Carolyn, you were talking to candidates as all of this was rolling out. What were some of the impacts on them for having signed up for one campaign and being given another? Well, it's risky business for some candidates. It's, it's fine for the MHAs. They get paid throughout the campaign process. But if you're a newcomer, uh, you're, you may have to leave your job, take a leave of absence. So there's lost income there. Uh, and also time consuming, time away from your family. Uh, I heard from some candidates who are really, really struggling with this whole process. And I'm sure that they're very anxious to find find out these results. So we are still waiting for these results. You'll notice there are still zeros across the bottom of the board. We're waiting for all that data from elections Newfoundland and Labrador, the votes that they've tallied to come in to our system. And as soon as that does happen, we're going to see the numbers on the screen change very quickly. It won't just be a few numbers here and there like we're used to on election night. Normally we kind of build up to who's going to form the government, but the results are going to come in. While we're waiting for those results, let's head to our panel for uh, I'm sure that they are all nervously watching everything as oh wait never mind we have some results let's take a look the Liberals 22 seats and that means we are ready to make an election call CBC News can now project that Andrew Fury will get his Liberal majority government this is the reason that he went to the polls. He wanted to get that majority. He said he needed that majority, and today he got it. He has just one seat above. It takes 21 to get a majority. He got 22 seats. The PCs, they took a hit. They're down to 13 seats. Independents, though, there are three independents. And the NDP, they're down a seat as well. They have two. There is a live shot of the Liberal headquarters. 
It's a rather empty looking ballroom and uh, all eyes on the door there for when Andrew Fury does make his way into this ballroom and is going to speak to reporters. So let's take a look at how the votes actually broke down as a percentage. Here's some of the big picture numbers for you. So the Liberals got 48% of the vote, and that's ahead of the 45% that you traditionally need in order to get a majority. The PCs were about 10 points behind them, 38% of the vote. The NDP with 8%. The Independents picked up uh, almost 5% of the vote. And the others, which would include the NL Alliance, just 0.4% of the votes. So how did the Liberals manage to get this majority? Where did the seats move around? So they picked up two seats from the last election. It largely came at the expense of the PCs. They've lost two seats today. And when we look at independence, it's up one. That's from the last election. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, Perry Trimper was a liberal when he won last time. He's left and become an independent. And the NDP, they've lost a seat in this election. They are now down to two, the bare minimum they need for official party status. And we're going to see a bit of an upset here. Let's have a look at how the party leaders did. Andrew Fury winning by over a thousand votes, 1,300 votes. Not uh, a surprise, his, he did well. Yes, not a surprise at all. Moving on to Chess Crosby. Well, look at this, Windsor Lake, John Hogan, uh, uh, also a lawyer, the same as uh, Chess Crosby, taking this seat from the PC leader. This is a Huge. big move. Huge. Chess Crosby, he's the PC leader, but he does not have a seat now. Uh, and this is, we saw some signs of this during the campaign because he spent about a third of that initial campaign in his own district. Which is unusual for a leader. Normally they like to travel the province and try and boost some of their candidates up, but we saw early on that he was in trouble. John Hogan, we're going to be introducing him uh, to a lot of people mm -hmm. who may not know him, but he's been behind the scenes with the Liberals. He co-chaired Andrew Fury's leadership campaign. He and Andrew Fury were tight. Clearly, uh, we saw Andrew Fury doing a bunch of campaigning in that district, a lot of retweets of John Hogan's tweets to try and boost his profile during this campaign. And clearly that worked because they were able to unseat the PC leader. So uh, this may be a sign of why uh, Chess Crosby wasn't wanting to face reporters live today if he had some instinct that this was coming. Here's another big one, St. John's East Kitty Vitti, Allison Coffin, the NDP leader. This is two leaders of two parties losing their seat, not by much. John Abbott, who actually ran for the leadership against Andrew Fury, he has picked up the seat by 53 votes. This is the closest race in the entire province. We thought that there might be some close races here. This is as tight as it's going to get today. Uh, it, it's, this is actually really shocking because this has been an NDP stronghold. Lots of oh. parties have put great candidates up against the NDP, and every time the NDP has been able to knock them off. But today, this all changed as John Abbott was able to go in, knock off Allison Coffin. We now have two of the three parties who don't have leaders with seats, and we now have big questions about the future of the leadership of those parties. When you have a leader who can't win their seats, it's normally not a good sign that they're going to be hanging along. So let's go to Terry Roberts, who is at Liberal headquarters. Terry, they got the majority and they got two of their opponents defeated. What's the mood like for the Liberal supporters who are there? Yeah, I think uh, Peter is a little bit mixed. Uh, 22 is not a huge majority. It's a it's a slim majority, so uh, I, I got a sense uh, I was uh, standing next to some uh, party officials as they were watching the results come in, and uh, there were some surprises. They were thinking they would uh, win some districts, uh, like, for example, Labrador West. Uh, uh, Jordan Brown with the NDP ran away with that one. He won by only two votes last time. Uh, this time he ran away with that district, uh, beating uh, Nick McGraw with the Tories and uh, Wayne Button uh, with the Liberals. So I think there's uh, you know, some, a mixed feeling here that um, maybe they could have done a little bit better, but uh, it is a majority government uh, nonetheless. 
Thanks, Terry. And we are expecting Alison Coffin to speak to reporters at the ballroom uh, in St. John's. And let's look at how the NDP has done in this race bef- while we're waiting for Alison Coffin to speak. So where did they pick up support? So Labrador, they saw a big jump in their support uh, compared to last time. And in fact, in a lot of areas, the Avalon, they're up two points. Uh, in the metro area, they were up three points despite losing one of the seats in the metro area. So they were able to pick up some votes, but unfortunately it wasn't in the right districts to be able to translate that into seats, which is why they've lost two seats today. All right, so let's have a closer look at some of those uh, NDP wins. Jordan Brown, as uh, Terry mentioned, last time he won by only two votes. <laughs> Much bigger win this time, 579 votes, uh, taking out Wayne Button and Nick McGraw. And St. John's Centre, Jim Din heading back to the House of Assembly, uh, 714 votes ahead of Gemma Hickey, who is a high-profile activist in the St. John's area. Absolutely. It was uh, she was a bit of a star candidate or they were a bit of a star candidate for the Liberals. So, uh, you know, this was one that they thought they might be able to win. As Terry was talking about some of that disappointment that maybe their win isn't as big as they would have liked it to have been. Uh, But, yeah, the big question for the NDP, of course, is now going to be what's next. Do either of those two want to lead the party? Uh, Because it's very hard. We've had a lot of struggles with the NDP having a leader who doesn't have a seat in the House of Assembly. We saw that Earl McCurdy tried several times to get a seat. He didn't. And so that, you know, was, and he, that's why he stepped down as leader. He said, look, I'm not effective if I don't have a seat in the legislature. Let's go to our panel now for a bit of reaction to this news because, uh, Yeah, there's lots for us to talk about. Jerry Rogers, Colin Holloway, and Sandy Collins. Uh, So, Jerry, we were just talking about the NDP. What's your reaction here to Alison Coffin losing? Well, I think it's really unfortunate. Alison has been a great politician, both in the House and also uh, uh, in in the province. Uh, And I think it's a loss to the province. She's been able to really pressure government uh, hold it to accountability. Uh, Allison, it's, and I think she's a casualty of this, as I said, mad hatter tea party type of election that we've just seen. And um, I would uh, think that it's a loss to the province right now. She was a good leader. Uh, she had a great handle on the economic situation of the province. And um yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm saddened by this. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are saddened by this. Uh, when you look at the 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 spread, it was a 53 votes. I know personally. I know a number of people in that district who tried desperately to get their ballots uh, that Friday before the the deadline um, and couldn't get through. So uh, I this one might be held in question. It'll be interesting. It doesn't qualify for an automatic recount, but if they feel that there were enough irregularities that might have tipped that result, it's certainly something that Alison Coffin could uh, ask for a recount. Sandy Collins, uh, you said it, it, it was a you said it was do or die time for the PCs. Uh, the Liberals got their majority government with their 22 seats. Chess Crosby lost his seat. Uh, what do you think is next? Well, I think with both Allison and Chess, they failed to connect over the time they were elected, obviously, and to build the base of the party. Uh, and it's also a result of just both of those candidates going up against really good liberal candidates. And I think uh, I think that's what we see here today. Um, with regards to what comes next for the PCs, um, you know, we've got some people within the party, within the uh, elected MHAs. I think, you know, Tony Wakeham, our own local MHA, Lloyd Parrott. Chris Tibbs out in Grand Falls, or Buckins. I'm not sure we're there, and that's just a couple. I'm sure I could go on to name a few more. So uh, I, I think we're going to have to go back and uh, reassess where the party oh. is and where it needs to go. And, I, I, and starvations to uh, Premier Fury and the Liberal Party. A few internet issues there in Glovertown. Uh, we're expecting the NDP leader to speak in about in about 30 seconds. So quickly, Colin Holloway, you didn't think a majority was possible. The Liberals got it. What do you think? Well, I think that's great for Andrew Fury. 
Um, you know, I had a bit of a range. Uh, 22 was probably on the outside of what I thought was, you know, slimly possible. I'm glad for him, glad for the party. Uh, there are some surprises. Uh, I didn't expect this to happen to, to Alison Coffin. I, I, I honestly thought she was going to keep that seat. But there were a few surprises, even uh, saying uh, uh, for Jim Lester, you know, that was a real surprise. Overall, the numbers, uh, yeah, it gives Andrew Fury the mandate, I think, uh, in order to move forward and deal with the Green Report and the major problems in this province. Well, thank you very much, all three, and we are going to come back to you for some more insights, especially as we hear from the three leaders and uh, what they have to say. Uh, all three of them have significant announcements that we'll be looking for around the future of their own political careers, uh, especially for Alison Coffin. And uh, here is, this is NDP headquarters, and we've got Kyle Reese with the party who is doing a little introduction. Let's listen in live. Here are the words of this poem. A weight most wouldn't take to lead with love and wisdom for love and wisdom's sake. To stand up for those comfortably seated takes a sacrifice, a noble notion that their well-being can be maintained or even improved by a woman willing to so, uh, fill the space. A poem there being read as we Some wait call for it thankless, uh, but the reward a poem there being read as space. we wait for Alison Coffin to Folks, come up and Allison take Coffin, the stage. And, and here she Party. is coming up. So uh, let's go there live. So there is Alison Coffin getting some uh, handshakes and a few hugs from... Uh, other candidates who weren't able to be successful. She was able to lead the party to two seats, but unfortunately one of those seats that she has isn't her own. Uh, so that's going to be one of the big questions here today is what Alison Coffin's political future looks like across this province. So here she is. Let's hear what wow. the NDP leader has to say. What a fine looking group of candidates. <laughs> Today is a historic moment. It will serve as a resounding lesson in democracy. It will be the dark day in our history telling us we must do better. Our candidates have overcome astounding adversity. Our democratic uh, sensibilities have been assailed. Amid a pandemic and a Newfoundland and Labrador winter, we have the lowest voter turnout ever. Thousands more are complaining about the vote. Thousands more again are feeling disenfranchised. And there are already speculations about court challenges waiting on the steps of the Supreme Court. Throughout it all, new Democrats put their heart and soul into a campaign ran on conviction and values. We ran on transparency and accountability to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. We stood strong and proud for fair wages, quality public sector jobs, and public sector services. We stood for health care workers and seniors and dental care and the right for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to be able to live, work and raise a family in the place that they call home. Our dynamic 
and inspiring and diverse group of candidates brought that message loud and clear and I could not be prouder. Newfoundlanders, Labradorians and our friends and neighbors stepped up to show that we can make a difference in our province and it has been an honor to campaign with you all. The formidable Sheila O'Leary, the magnanimous Jen Dion, the stalwart Gavin Will, Jim Din, <laughs> Carolyn Davis, and every last one of you who could not make it here today to be with us, I am so proud of you. In Labrador, we had Jordan Brown, Amy Norman, and Patricia Johnson Castle, who went above and beyond. <laughs> Patricia, on her own, paid, not only paid, to get voter information translated into indigenous languages, but did something pretty incredible and got Elections NL to commit to translating future election information into indigenous languages. <laughs> and French. So proud. Huge, huge thank yous to all our candidates for their dedication, commitment, and sacrifice. My sincerest congratulations to Jim Din and Jordan Brown and their campaign teams. They will fight for everyday people of Newfoundland and Labrador. You have a voice in them. <laughs> After seeing the Liberals manipulate our broken electoral system for their own political gain, I guarantee you that Jim and Jordan are galvanized in ensuring the elections like this will never happen again. But Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will always question this election. Sure, we're still talking about the Confederation vote. <laughs> it's hard to believe that two short years ago, I became the leader of the New Democrats of Newfoundland and Labrador. I made that choice to offer myself because I believe in the values that New Democrats espouse. I believe in the core values of our party. I believe that workers should get a living wage. I believe in stronger labor legislation to protect workers. I believe healthcare workers should not be facing constant burnout. I believe in mental, better mental health services. I believe that seniors should have enough money to pay for their rent, their food, and their medication. I believe in a fair society where everyone has an equal opportunity, one that is built on compassion, respect, and understanding. And throughout this election campaign, I know that every last one of us stood strong behind those values. And New Democrats will continue to do so. Despite the difficulties, the adversities, the setbacks, I know in my heart and in my soul that two years ago, I made the right decision. To the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, you deserve better than you have gotten from decades of liberal and conservative governments. Your families deserve better, the people you love deserve better. <laughs> the 
This pandemic has exposed the decay of our fundamental institutions caused by decades of neglect. When Andrew Fury called this midwinter pandemic election, he said that he needed a majority in order to do the things he needed to do. Well, what that tells me is he will not raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And I will guarantee you that that green report will remain hidden until he's good and ready to cut jobs and cut services. <laughs> Andrew Fury's leadership and administration will be forever tarnished by the lingering questions posed by this election. To the people of St. John's East, Kitty Vitty, I have been honored to serve you as an MHA. I have enjoyed every single minute of this experience. Every conversation and every smile will be remembered for years to come quite fondly. For that, I am truly humbled for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. It has been an incredible pleasure to work with Jordan Brown and Jim Din. Each of these gentlemen have been an enormous support for their constituents and to me personally. They have guided me, offered me wisdom, and helped me through the difficult times. I very much look forward to seeing them continue to fight for the people of St. John's Center and Labrador West. And I want them to know that I will be here to help them however and whenever I can. This has been a very long campaign and, and none of us have expected it to be this long. I say to them both now, take the time, spend it with your family, thank them, enjoy their support. Because I guarantee you, the spring session of the House of Assembly is guaranteed to be quite a good one. Today, we saw the election results as they are today. Monday may bring something new. Probably not the Green Report. <laughs> <sighs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I started to try and make a list of everyone to say thanks to, and I couldn't, so pardon me. Um, volunteers, and, and, a, and a special thank you to Ray Hocko, you're, you're incredible, sir. Um, the campaign team who put in so many long hours, all of our donors, our supporters, our candidates, our party executive, our party members, our friends and brothers and sisters in labor, everybody who has put in the And that is Allison Coffin there the speaking to supporters, uh, saying that the voters deserve better. Interestingly, she didn't talk about what her own future might look like as leader of the party. It did sound very much like a sort of farewell speech. I'll be around to do whatever I can. Uh, but I think that's going to be one of the first questions that reporters are going to have for her is, is she going to stick around as, as the NDP leader, even though she no longer has a seat? And then the follow-up question is, do Jim Din or Jordan Brown have aspirations to lead the party? Let's take a look at the summary that we're looking at. So this is how the parties, this is how the Liberals have done. Um, where did they pick up their support in order to pick up their seats? Well, the metro area, up eight points. That's a big gain for them as they took away two of those leader seats in the metro area. Uh, Eastern Newfoundland up almost four points. The Avalon in general, they are up seven points. Uh, the one area where they are actually down in support is uh, in Labrador. They lost 16 points. Uh, so significant there, especially because Perry Trimper won as a liberal last time. They weren't getting his votes uh, this time as an independent. So Alison Coffin, John Abbott, that's where the liberals managed to pick up one of those seats. So let's see where another seat was picked up. That is Mount Pearl North. This is the second tightest margin in this election. Lucy Stoyles has won this seat, taking it from Jim Lester by 109 votes. Yeah, she's well known as a Mount Pearl uh, councillor there. And let's talk about some of the cabinet ministers because uh, they've all done fairly well for themselves. <laughs> yes, no surprise here. The man who has been front and center during this pandemic, Health Minister John Hagee, uh, back in the game, uh, or returning to the House of Assembly, I should say, by over 
22,000 votes. Uh, Finance Minister Siobhan Cody, a uh, very uh, great uh, <laughs> margin there as well, over 2,000 votes. Tom Osborne, no surprise here. He's the longest serving uh, uh MHA, MHA yeah. in this province's history. He's currently the education minister, very high profile portfolio. Steve Crocker, education minister, also winning by a wide margin, almost 2,300 votes. Andrew Parsons as well. Look at that huge lead. Huge, huge lead. Uh, 1,700 votes uh, in the lead there for Bergio Lapoil. Yeah, so all the former cabinet ministers were reelected, but with a bigger caucus. They may not be guaranteed to get their old jobs back. We are looking live there at Liberal headquarters, and that is the door that we're expecting Andrew Fury to walk in any minute now as he addresses the friends and family who've gathered in a St. John's ballroom uh, in order to congratulate him on his win. You know, he's a newcomer to politics. A year ago, he was just an orthopedic surgeon uh, with dreams and aspirations. And today, he has now been elected as, a, as the leader of a party. He's been elected as an MHA. And he now has that majority government that he's looking for. He comes from a long uh, political family. His uncle, Chuck Fury, was an MHA on the Northern Peninsula for years. A very well-known name there. So he had folks behind the scenes able to offer him some of those expertise that he's lack, lacked as someone who is brand new to elected politics. Although he has been behind the scenes, he co-chaired the federal liberal campaign in this province. Uh, so, you know, he's, he put in a lot of years of work behind the scenes in order to try and build up his profile within the party, in order to try and build up the support. And uh, it's all been leading to this moment, his first win in a general election as the leader of the party. And he got those 22 seats in order to give him the majority, 13 seats for the PC, three independents, and two NDP. It's very unusual to have more independents than NDP. And in fact, if, uh, if the independents managed to uh, band together and form a party, they would in fact have third party status. It would require all of them to agree. But uh, let's go to Kelly Bleduc, who's been watching this election unfold over the last 10 weeks. So, Kelly, just first, what are your initial thoughts on the results that we've seen here today? Um, well, I, I mean, I guess it's in the ballpark of what I was probably expecting. Uh, the turnout is, is a significant drop. Um, I actually thought we'd see a slightly bigger number of liberal seats. I mean, they went into this with, with quite a significant lead. Uh, but at the same time, we've had a number of problems in this election. We've sort of documented those over the over the previous weeks, right? Um, but 48% as a turnout number is sort of in the ballpark of what I was expecting, maybe even a little higher. I thought we could even see it down to 45 or, or in the lower 40s. But uh, it's still a, a significant drop from what we've seen in the past. Um, and besides that, I guess the, the change in seats for the two uh, opposition party leaders uh, one of them being quite close, one being uh, a bit more distant. I'm I'm quite interested to see how the parties choose to react to this. Because on one hand, if you're going to contest the election as a whole, there may not be any great movement immediately in terms of what they want to do as leaders. Uh, but normally under the circumstances, uh, especially where you've seen a drop in the, in the vote for the party and also where you see a leader lose their seat, as we saw with Chess Crosby, normally you would see a resignation in that case. I'm not certain we'll see that here, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. The, the result that we're seeing here for Andrew Fury, the fact that he went from 60 percent at the start of this election down to the 40 some percent that he his party was able to win. How much of that do you think is on him and how much of that is just the circumstances of a, a, a second wave of a pandemic and a lot of anger over the voting process that uh, ended up sticking to him somewhat? Yeah, it's funny because, I mean, elections are always usually sort of a snapshot in time. You can see big variations in popularity sometimes, but the election kind of captures whatever it is on a given day or, or within a, a week or two. Here we saw it play out over a longer period, and that drop uh, might suggest that, in fact, popularity was continuing to drop, uh, that if they had managed to complete this election uh, more quickly, if they had actually held it in February and there was no, no uh, breakout of, of COVID, that they may have gotten more more support and they may have gotten more seats. So I think in some ways that's a, that does play to the, you know, the risks that were taken with this election. The fact that calling it when there was a pandemic, uh, calling it, of course, in the winter and other things that we, we knew were sort of risks in terms of turnout uh, were going to matter. 
But beyond that, yeah, it's quite possible then that some of that uh, support uh, eroded as people saw that that risk didn't play out well. You were talking about the voter turnout there, Kelly. Let, let's just take a look at those numbers and look at our overall voter turnout. So it was 48%, and that is a drop of 12% from the last election. Uh, and this is now a record for the lowest voter turnout ever in Newfoundland and Labrador politics. Although important to point out, it's not the lowest voter turnout for any province. Uh, Alberta has actually set, th they had an election where there was just 40% voter turnout there. Uh, so, Kelly, what, what do you think this does to the legitimacy of Andrew Fury's majority? So I'd just say there's a number of questions about this election and turnout isn't isn't the only one. Turnout may play into this because if the question becomes one of did did uh, did the government or did essentially elections NL facilitate people's votes effectively, uh, a drop like this suggests in fact that perhaps that didn't occur. Um, so I think it does definitely put some some question on this. But at the end of the day, the courts aren't going to look and say, oh well, the turnout was a given number, therefore it's it's a good election or it's a bad election. It will, nevertheless, though, probably be an element of, of evidence to, to support a, a broader argument that uh, voting wasn't properly facilitated here. So, uh, you know, I've said this before, uh, whether, whether Andrew Fury wants to take a different approach or whether other leaders want to take a different approach, I've said that we should, we should ar always take this result with some caution. We should get some legal eyes on what occurred here. We should wait for the chief electoral officer's report, which is due within one month and make some decisions from that point going forward. It would be, to me, a huge mistake to take this as a mandate to do something and to affect a platform when, in fact, uh, there's a possibility courts will say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Do you expect that this is going to drag on in the courts, considering the closest race was uh, Alison Coffins with fewer than 60 votes? And when you talk about voter turnout, uh, we just want to show you Torngat Mountains because it either wins or loses the award, it had the lowest voter turnout of any of the districts. Uh, so Layla Evans managed to get re-elected there in that district with uh, quite a substantial lead there uh, ahead of the NDP and the Liberal candidates, but uh, a lot fewer votes there. Uh, so, Kelly, uh, we were talking about court challenges with this. Uh, do you think, rarely do we actually see court challenges or recounts changing the results of individual races, especially with more than 50 votes uh, in Allison Coffin's district, for example. Do you think anything will change when this goes through the courts, if it goes through the courts? So this is a, this is a good question. I, I have a hard time answering if it if it will change or if it won't change, uh, what I'd say is that we still have a degree of uncertainty. And that's, again, like, to look at a gap of, of uh, in a given district is not really the question so much as we could ask, you know, if, if voters were facilitated. So let's imagine that we had an election in which 60% of people were able to vote, vote, and that was what we were, you know, probably expecting, and that drops by 12%. Then can we actually look at a difference of 5% or 6% or 10% in a district and say that it's valid or it's invalid. That, those would be definitely questions to be answered. I'm not, I, I'm not in a position to say what would ultimately be determined. Um, I mean, a lot of this comes back around to would a court look and say that people's rights were violated in terms of, their, in terms of the facilitation of them being able to vote. Um, so I, I'm not convinced that simply because there's a difference of a given percentage in a district that that will in and of itself determine that it's a valid result or an invalid result. Um, I think we need to go a little bit deeper into it and say what sorts of people were being disenfranchised, if at all. Uh, and I think we need to go further than that. I mean, the NDP has brought up questions of spoiled ballots and the, the, the questions around that. So we, if we're looking at a result, and again, let's imagine that 2 or 3% of, of votes are, are spoiled. Okay, sorry, Kelly, um, we, we got to cut you off is, there because from. Andrew Fury is just heading into that ballroom. He's there with his family and uh, giving them a few kisses before he heads up onto the stage. He is the premier. He has his majority. Let's listen in live as Andrew Fury addresses the province after his re-election. Well, thank you all. It's an honor and privilege to stand before you as our province's 14th Premier. To continue as Premier is to stand as a fighter in a proud legacy 
of fighters for Newfoundland and Labrador throughout our history and for the battles we are about to face together. Let me tell you wholeheartedly, I am ready to go. I'd like to, of course, first start with a special thank you to Allison for being my best campaign partner and, frankly, the best anyone can ask for. This election... <laughs> this election has been a long road, and you've been there every step of the way. I couldn't do this without your tireless energy and unwavering support. Thank you, Maggie, Rachel, and Mark. You guys, as always, are my heart. And I want to spend, send a special thanks to my father for his guidance and counsel, and to all my family for being a part of this journey with me. Thank you to the good people of the District of Humber Gross Morn for again putting their trust in me to represent them in our House of Assembly. I want to thank in particular my district campaign manager, Helen Reed, and her entire team in Humber Gross Morn. And thank you to you, the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, you have challenged us to live up to an expectation no other government in this province has ever faced before. But take a look at the team you've elected. These are the right people to rise to that challenge and to move our province forward. I also want to thank our Liberal co campaign co-chairs, Judy Moreau and John Sams, and our team, all of whom never once lost steam on this long and incredibly winding journey to the finish. I'm so proud of all our Liberal candidates and thank each and every one of you for your dedication and inspiring campaigns. And to all our volunteers, supporters, anyone who made a call, knocked on a door, put up a sign, or helped spread our message of hope, I wish you could all be on this stage with me today because you are all a part of this. To my opponents, Mr. Crosby and Ms. Coffin, and to everyone who took the bold step putting their name on a ballot as a candidate in this election, I commend your fighting spirit and the campaigns you all ran. Nothing speaks louder to the love of this province than the effort of those who stepped forward for public office. Throughout this campaign, I've consistently referred to the fight ahead of us. Everyone in our province knows too well the reality of the situation. And we've been told again and again that the odds are stacked against us. But that's also the very first thing you'll be told in any great comeback story. And it starts here. It starts today with a clear majority government mandate you have given us. Because for the government I will lead, this is no longer a crossroad. It is one road, forward. There is no precedent for what we've been through in this past year. Nothing to guide us. But that means now, now, is the time for boldness. Our dire economic outlook was further burdened by the pandemic, and it took a massive toll. But it has also exposed an even bigger opportunity, a chance to make a tectonic shift in who we are and where we're going as a province. It can be a giant step forward. The question is, are we bold enough to take it? Yes, yes we are. My friends, we didn't get in this position overnight, and there are no overnight solutions. But we must always, move forward. A bold new province will be a place that continually evolves, a place that embraces the fearlessness of reinvention, a place that runs on its large store of imagination. Of course, the driving force behind all of this is you, the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I know you're all anxious to see the end of the pandemic, and you worry about what's next for our province, what more we can handle. Hopefully, by the end of June, everyone in our province will have their first dose of the vaccine. And hopefully, we can start putting COVID-19 behind us. But there are still hard decisions in front of us. But together, we will decide the direction we take. Together, we will draw that map. That means we all must look 10 years down the road to see what we hope our province will be for ours and every generation that follows. We must boldly embrace that vision and step collectively towards it, towards transitioning our economy to renewable energy, maximizing our oil and gas advantage today to build a future forward-based energy position for our province. 
towards fostering the climate to support new and growing technology companies in our province. They are doing such innovative work, and I'm truly excited to see what giant steps are next. Toward new approaches to ensure our traditional sectors stay strong and vibrant. One of our oldest industries, the fisheries, employing the newest thinking for sustainability and taking our top products to broader markets. And our mining industry is being reimagined and reinvigorated by a global demand for minerals and resources readily available right here at home. Toward drawing more tourists to our province, this place has long been a bucket destination and for good reason. Our tourism product doesn't disappoint. There isn't a cove or a corner that isn't someone's memory in the making. And today we're happy the province has lifted the lockdowns and we have a true reason to be optimistic. To welcome more and more people from around the world to become Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. To move from population decline to population growth. Its economic benefits are only exceeded by the wealth it brings to an already diverse culture, building a strong and diverse workforce for the future. To continue to strengthen our bonds with Indigenous peoples by understanding that reconciliation is not just a word, it's a path forward. To help unburden our healthcare system by becoming a healthier people, focusing on building healthy communities and families that are able to fully partake in what our province has to offer. To relieve our province from what I can only describe as its long dependence on debt. The first step in realizing all of this may be the hardest for some. That step is to be part of a unified front. There is no divide that betw between us that we can't be bridged when we put the province first. We may differ politically. You may have issue with me, this party, or this government. But I'm not asking you to take, put that aside. I'm asking you to put the province first. Because the momentum we seek will come from many hands. To do this means boldness now. What we will accomplish together in the next four years can define our province for generations to come. What is next may be hard, but at the same time is brightly exciting. We have come to a point in our history where the road ahead is a little foggy, perilous, no doubt. But if we are bold now, we have a once in a lifetime chance to change the trajectory of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today is a moment's pause a pause in a journey that for me began a year ago with a head full of ideas on the difference I wanted to make for the people of our province. How I refuse to be swayed by the many opinions of those who have written this place off. Yes, last March does feel like a lifetime ago. But I think back on how many miles I've traveled since then, the communities I've visited, the many faces, young and old, I've met with, listened to, and most importantly, learned from. It feels like every one of them is in this room today. And they're not here to celebrate. They're here to remind me, to hold me to the simple truth that when you ask people to push, you better push with them. That when you ask them to sacrifice, you have to give every single thing you have. When you ask them to believe, you carry their hopes. That when you say you will speak for them, you do so loudly, honestly, and only with the best intentions in mind. The time for boldness is now Newfoundland and Labrador. From here, it is forward only, forward always. Thank you. And that is Premier Andrew Fury talking to supporters in the ballroom in St. John's. A lot of talk about difficult choices and being bold like the campaign, he didn't elaborate on what those bold choices or what those difficult decisions might be. And those will certainly be some of the questions for him now that he has that majority that he said he needed in order to make those changes. How is he going to use it and what are the things that he is going to change in this province?
You see them there with his wife Allison and their kids. Uh, it's been a stressful time and in fact we're told that he's taking tomorrow off. He's not doing interviews tomorrow. He's going to spend it with his family. Uh, but we, before he goes off to do that, we are expecting him to join us one-on-one -on -one a little later in the show where we can ask him some of those questions about where he's going to go. Just as a reminder, Liberals sitting with 22 seats, PCs with 13. We've got three independents and the New Democrats dropping one seat in order. Now They're now down to two seats. Let's take a look at what the situation looks like across the province. And let's take a look at the map. And here is how the province looks now. In particular, though, we want to zoom in on the metro area because uh, look at how red that is. Uh, this is where the Liberals picked up two of their seats, uh, taking away one from the NDP, taking away another one from the PCs. This is an area that, you know, the Metro St. John's area, traditionally fairly strong for the PCs. They've managed to keep the whole surrounding area, but the Liberals are a whole lot, managed to take away some seats. Uh, and let's take a look at how the Conservatives did overall. Where did they pick up support? Where did they lose it? Well, if you talk about the metro area, they're down seven and a half points in the metro area. That's the biggest drop of any area, and uh, that's also why, where they lost two of their seats. Overall, they got almost 39% of the vote. Uh, another big drop in eastern Newfoundland in general. Uh, Labrador, a big drop for them as well. They're down six points there. Uh, interestingly, Central was one of the areas where they actually did pick up a few more seats. Let's take a look now at what the PC leader has to say. Chess Crosby does not have a seat now. He lost it to the Liberals, and he's not speaking to reporters right now, but he did put out a statement. Here's what he had to say. I've spoken with Andrew Fiore and Alison Coffin and offered them and their teams on behalf of our party my sincere congratulations on a hard-fought election campaign. Every candidate and every volunteer who stepped forward in this campaign is a winner because democracy wins when voters have a real choice and the choices our party put forward in this campaign were second to none. Thank you, Progressive Conservative team. An election can produce only one government, and the people's right to choose is absolute. That is what democracy means, and I am democracy's most vigorous advocate. So today, I state unequivocally that I respect the will of the people. But let's not forget, in an election, the people choose not only their government, they also choose an official opposition to hold the government's feet to the fire and advocate for people. And it has never been more important than right now to accept this role that the people, in their great wisdom, have placed on this party's shoulders. Please let me take a moment to thank my family, my mother Jane, my wife Lois, my three daughters Charlotte, Catherine, and Rachel. Your steadfast support has always been my foundation. And thanks again to my daughter Rachel for trying your very best. I am sure we will have many more conversations about this in the months to come. Let me thank the voters of Windsor Lake. Thank you for the opportunity to represent you in the House of Assembly since 2018. You will always have a special place in my heart. In light of the outcome of the election, I will be speaking with my family, my caucus, and the executive of our party. And I will take a few days to reflect on what has happened and determine where we go from here. Let me conclude with a message to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians because it is for you and your families, your communities, and your future that we step forward as candidates and parties to seek the honor of representing you and serving you. Newfoundland and Labrador is our home, the place we love, a place we aspire to prosper and sustain. So the future we leave to the next generation is brighter and more secure. We step forward to serve because we see people in need and we also see a wealth of opportunities to meet those needs and lift our province higher. 
So let us renew our resolve to make Newfoundland and Labrador everything we are so richly capable of becoming. Thank you. And there is Chess Crosby delivering a pre-recorded message. Uh, when he delivered a live speech after the 2019 election, he ended up having to walk much of it back. So this time, opting to go with a scripted pre-recorded message. Worth pointing out there, he said that he's not resigning as PC leader despite losing a seat. He's going to take some time, talk to the party and, the fa and his family to see where they go. It, it was actually a very similar message that we heard from Alison Coffin when she was speaking to reporters after her speech, saying, She's going to talk to the party. She's going to think it over for a couple of days. So they so far are still the leaders of their party. But let's bring in the panel to talk a bit about how things go uh, from here, especially for those parties, but also for the liberals with their majority. So Colin Holloway, let's start uh, with you. That speech that we just heard from Andrew Fury, he's talking about hard choices. He's talking about boldness. What do you think that's going to actually mean? Uh, well, first, Peter, I'd say that, uh, you know, I thought it was a great speech. Uh, you know, it's a side of Andrew Fury we really haven't seen at this point. And I guess because he's been, you know, campaigning for most of the, you know, the, the past 12 months. Uh, but the hard choices, yeah, as I said earlier, the green that uh, there's a lot of things that got to be addressed in this problem from infrastructure, you know, even uh, you think about the relationships that have to be cemented here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things uh, with the nurses. These are all things that have come up in the past year. So that's a real focus for Andrew. He has, uh, I think, the clear mandate now to move forward with that. I mean, even in the House, uh, when you think about that, there are some things that have to come forward with those tough choices. And uh, Premier Fury did talk about, you know, the, the, that boldness many times throughout his speech. Uh, in the House, you'll have likely 18 members that may not agree with everything that this government is going to bring forward. You'll have 22. No other choice because they know in order to right the ship, and I think that's what Premier Fury talked about, writing the ship, he talked about, you know, tectonic uh, shifting in the province. All of those mean that there is some, there's, it's a tough road ahead. But, uh, you know, he also referenced it 10 years from now. So I suspect what he's going to lay out is going to probably give a brighter future for the province, but it's going to take up to 10 years to do it. And uh, so the change, it's going to be tough, but it's, uh, it's, it's unnecessary, but it's going to be not as, uh, not as great as impact as we all might surmise. Jerry Rogers, the last, after the last election, the NDP held the balance of power. They had a fair amount of influence in what the government ended up doing. How do you think it's going to be different now with the Liberals having that majority? Well, I think that, you know, the role of the NDP will continue to really call a government into account, but also to collaborate. And I think that's what we saw before this election when there was a minority government. We saw the collaboration. And I think that's what the people of the province want. They want our government to be collaborative, to work together, because what's facing us is really, really difficult. As, as Andrew Fury said, what is next may be hard, but we're not quite sure how hard it is for different people. Uh, so I think the, the NDP once again will be, uh, have to push for the issues that really affect people's lives. And now more than ever, boy, does this ever point to the need for democratic reform, electoral reform. We have to update and modernize our election, our uh, act. Uh, we must never, never see this kind of election again. Uh, I think when we look at the, I, I, I really liked Andrew Fury's speech. Um, I, I thought Allison was incredibly gracious and uh, as well, a great speech. And, you know, uh, Chess Crosby was dignified. So there's a lot of work ahead of everyone now. And I think what really I would like to say at this point is, is, is is a, a big thank you to all the candidates who did run. This was a really hard campaign for many and for their families and for those who uh, had no income for much longer than they had planned for. Uh, but boy, it's it's time. It's, it's, it's time to really look at our democratic process. We all deserve better. 
We've been talking a lot about the Green Report, and for anyone who hasn't been following, this is the report that Moya Green was asked by the Premier before the election to put together some options for how to fix the fiscal situation in the province, how to change the economy. It's been delayed till after the election, so within the next month or so, we're expecting to see what's in it. And Andrew Fury has promised collaboration on whether those uh, ideas get implemented by his government. Uh, Sandy, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, we heard Chess Crosby there saying he's going to take a couple of days to think about whether he should stay on as leader. Is there a world under which you think he actually does stay on? Uh, I don't believe so. Not at this point. There's, um, as I'd said, many, many thought after the last general election, uh, his days were numbered, but uh, he stuck around for this one. I foresee in a couple days uh, an announcement coming out with an interim leader being named. And as I had said in my earlier comments, which I don't know if some of them were cut off due to the technical issues, but you know we had people within our party, whether it be Tony Wakeham, our own local MHA, Lloyd Parrott, or uh, Chris Tibbs out in Grand Falls, Windsor, Balkans, who had the ability, the, ca uh, the leadership capabilities to lead this party, as well as some people outside the party. Um, so I don't know what the aspirations are at this point, but we have options. And I think with uh, Chess's defeat, as well with Allison, it uh, gives two opposition parties an opportunity to hit a reset button. So thank you very much, all three of you, for your insights. Appreciate it as always. Carolyn, let's take a look at some more results. Yeah, we're going to start uh, in uh, Bayvert Green Bay. And uh, Cabinet Minister Brian Moore uh, keeps this seat. Uh, 171 votes ahead of PC Lynn Paddock. And next we're going to check out Bonavista. Craig Party holds on to his seat. Uh, about 1,200 votes there uh, ahead of Christine Gill, the Liberal candidate uh, in that district. The so last time around, this was one of the closest races. Neil King was only about 80 votes behind. Uh, and But this time, clearly... The people of Bonavista have decided that they like Craig Party and are willing to send him back. Yeah, and this one was up for grabs. This was Carol Ann Haley's district. She uh, was a status of women uh, minister or did not run in this election. Staying liberal, Paul Pike, uh, he is the mayor of St. Lawrence, captured uh, over a thousand votes. And uh, looking to Cape St. Francis, not much of a surprise here. This is a pretty Tory area in the province. Uh, Jody Wall, mayor of Pooch Cove. Uh, 1,900 votes. It's there. literally always gone conservative, yeah. so not a surprise it went conservative today. <laughs> and speaking of this, I guess cartwright line Claire is the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a district that almost always goes liberal. Yeah, and uh, cartwright line Claire, Lisa Dempster, almost 1,000 vo votes, just over 900 votes ahead of uh, the PC uh, candidate there, Joshua Nolan. Well, let's stay with Labrador because uh, we want to talk about the impact of the voting problems as well as the impact of the outcome that we've seen today. Eugene Hart is uh, the chief in Shehajit, and uh, he's with us now to uh, share some thoughts. So first of all, uh, Chief Hart, we saw Perry Trimper re-elected as your MHA. You've accused him of being racist in the past. How do you work with him on the many issues that are facing your community? Well, um, the way I see it, I'd like to congratulate everybody that's been elected today and re-elected. Um, just continuing the hope, so hope to continue the strategies of your issues in each community of New Zealand and Labrador. Um, I think that's still that's still the homework I'm going to be dealing with, uh, with the because we did meet with Perry. Uh, they're not Perry. Uh, the premier, so talking about the. Uh, there's supposed to be a racist uh, committee in the house, and I'm still waiting on that to be set up. And uh, hopefully now in the next coming months, we'll see that happening in the sitting up, sitting up the community, the committee. We heard a lot of concerns about how accessible voting was with a switch to mail-in ballots, with the fact that those ballots weren't translated into Inuimun. How did that play out in your community and the turnout and the number of people who were or weren't able to vote? Uh, a lot of people were disappointed that they couldn't, they couldn't vote there because we're, the pandemic came in so fast as well. Unexpectedly, the numbers went drastically high, went up to level five. So everything just went cloudy there for a few months. And with, with everybody's hard work, it just stopped in the months of the COVID as well. So what do you think the biggest issues are going to be that the uh, the new 
government under Andrew Fury are going to need to address for Shahajit? Uh, we still have a lot of issues in Shahajit, like the restored justice uh, needs to be spoken about again, and it has been brought up before, and the anti-racism committee group, like they're learning uh, to bring that back. I think that's a priority in, in our community, for both communities, Shahajit and Natwashish. It's important to learn about the people not just the people. A great perspective, and thank you very much, Chief Eugene Hart, for joining us and sharing it with us today. Thank okay. you. Okay, Peter, let's uh, have a look at some more results, starting with Conception Bay East, Bell Island. David Brazel, not much of a surprise here, keeping his seat, over 1,300 votes. He's a real constituency guy, so not much of a surprise there. And it'll be interesting, though, to see uh, he's one name that might be on the leadership contender. So it'll be some questions, especially with that solid win. His experience as one of the longest serving PCMHAs. Is he going to be interested in the job? We'll have to find out. Yeah. Conception Bay South, Barry Petten keeps his seat. Uh, just uh, over 1,100 votes there over Shelley Moore's liberal candidate, Cornerbrook. Cabinet Minister uh, Jerry Byrne staying put there with a... a 1,200 vote, 1,300 vote lead. Uh, exploits, Pleeman 4C is uh, keeping his seat as well. Not too much of a difference uh, there. 463 votes over uh, Liberal Rodney Mercy. Loyola O'Driscoll in Fairyland, another strong Tory area, uh, staying uh, put for the PCs. 500 votes over the Liberal candidate, Cheryl O'Brien. Yeah. Let's take a look at a few more districts. Fogo Island, Cape Friels, Derek Bragg, very colorful minister, uh, and uh, he is going to stay in that position, uh, or at least stay in as the MHA. We'll see about that cabinet You're position right. uh, with, when Andrew Fury decides on his new cabinet. Yeah, here we And Fortune Bay, Cape Lahoon, Elvis Loveless, probably the best name out of all of the candidates. Elvis Loveless. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Minister Loveless and uh, <laughs> Grand Falls Windsor Buckins, Chris Tibbs uh, was able to hold on and get reelected in that seat. Uh, the Liberals were kind of hoping they might be able to take it, but he has almost a thousand votes ahead of Liberal Debbie Ball. And Pam Parsons in Harbor Grace Port to Grave, 2,200 votes in the lead over the PC candidate in that area. A traditionally liberal area, so not a surprise there. Uh, this is an interesting race because George Murphy for the Liberals in Harbour, Maine, was seen as one of their sort of star candidates. He had served as an NDP MHA in the past, so has a fair amount of profile. But Helen Conway Ottenheimer, uh, who'd, who's been fairly outspoken as a PC MHA, she was able to get re-elected in Harbour, Maine. Okay. So interesting results as we're looking across the province there and uh, a lot of people re-elected but a lot of changes as well. Yep, for sure. And you know, government does have a big job ahead tackling the fiscal crisis. Uh, Andrew Fury has said many times that they're going to have to go to Ottawa for help on this. He campaigned on his friendly relationship with Justin Trudeau. Uh, joining us now is parliamentary reporter Chris Hall. So Chris, how do you think that call for help will be received in Ottawa. Well, hey, Carolyn, obviously from the standpoint of uh, Andrew Fury, it is important to have those connections, both political and personal here uh, in Ottawa with the Liberal government. There is Serge Dupont, a, a senior bureaucrat here, has been assigned to try to begin these negotiations, to continue the negotiations, to help Newfoundland through with the fiscal crisis it faces. So a couple of things that uh, Ottawa will be looking to do. One is how do they address uh, the, the, the shortfalls and the deficit debt being run up by uh, by Muskrat Falls. So that's the number one priority here. Uh, is there something they can do beyond deferring the interest payments to ensure uh, that the uh, cost of that doesn't end up being on the, the rate payers in Newfoundland and Labrador? The second thing, of course, is to get going with the Atlantic Loop. It's part of the green energy policies that the, the federal government wants to pursue. Uh, and obviously it made a mention of it both in the throne speech uh, back in September but also in the economic update that Finance Minister Christia Freeland uh, delivered. So those are the priorities for the, for the federal government to work uh, to advance their green agenda, but also to ensure that Newfoundland and Labrador doesn't end up in default, because if that happens, it's not just going to hurt the province. Uh, it obviously has a reflection on Canada and investor confidence in this country. 
Well, Chris, this has been a historic election for sure. Uh, chaotic, uh, very long. Uh, what do you think the Trudeau government, the federal government can learn from this pandemic election in this province? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? Two things. One is that I think that they understand that there may be some legal challenges here in Ottawa, uh, but that won't prevent them from dealing with, with the Liberal government uh, once it's fully formed uh, after Andrew Fury's victory. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, after you look at what happened, Newfoundland and Labrador had relatively few, if any, COVID cases when the election was called, and then just before voting, this happened. So I think as you look ahead to what the federal government and federal parties might do uh, is to consider what impact that would have nationally. If you have four and a half time zones across an entire country, whatever the situation might be when an election is called, there are variants already circulating in the, uh, in the community, uh, in some communities across this country. So they will take a really hard look at what plan B, what plan C would be required if something like that happened. And I think, if anything, it might have put a damper on any idea of going to the, the polls in the spring. Uh, I'm thinking personally from having discussions with all the parties that the fall is looking a little bit more likely for a federal election if there is one. Well, thank you so much for this. That's our national affairs editor, Chris Hall. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cheryl. Well, phew, we get a little bit of a break because last thing I think people in Newfoundland and Labrador want after the marathon election we've been through would be another spring federal election. Yes, <laughs> for sure. We're going to have a look at some more results now. Uh, Eddie Joyce, the man, the legend in uh, Harbour Bay of Islands, independent. This is his second time uh, being voted in as an independent by a pretty wide margin there, 2,200 votes. Uh, Lewisport Twillingate, Derek Bennett, uh, winning his seat back, cabinet minister, over a thousand votes there. And, and another people. independent, Paul Lane. This is historic. You know, we're seeing the rise of the independents over the last two elections. This is a province that only a couple of times had ever had them, and now we've had three independents all in one election. Uh, Paul Lane using his own popularity as Mr. Mount Pearl in order to uh, win that district uh, ahead of the Liberals. Mount Sio, uh, Sarah Studley winning back her seat there uh, by almost 900 votes. Another cabinet minister there. That's we'll right. see what her role is. And a former cabinet minister in Placentia St. Mary's, Sherry Gambin Walsh. And that was a pretty tough competition there against Calvin Manning, who's the brother of Fabian Manning. Placentia West Bellevue, Jeff Dwyer uh, wins his seat, 661 votes over Mayor Sam Sinyard. St. Barb Lance Meadows, uh, Krista Lynn Howell, uh, mayor in. Uh, up in that area? Yeah, so, and, and this one is, this was uh, held by the Liberals, but this was one where Chris Christopher... Chris Moore? Yeah, Christopher Mitch Moore decided not to run, so it's a, it'll be a new face in the House of Assembly, but it is a hold for the Liberals. And another hold for the Liberals is St. George's Humber. Yes, Scott Reed, uh, 946 votes over PC Gary Bishop. Stephenville Porta Port, Tony Wakeham is keeping his seat as well. 900 votes over Kevin Aylward, a former Liberal leader. In the district of Terra Nova, Lloyd Parrott uh, keeping his seat as well. 500, just over 500 votes over Steve Denty. Topsail Paradise, Paul Din, also winning his seat. Uh, 511 votes there over Ken Carter. And Virginia Waters, Pleasantville. This is uh, Tourism Minister Bernard Davis. Uh, 20, just over 2,200 votes ahead of Vic Lawler, the PC candidate in that area. Yeah, so quite an interesting results there, seeing a lot of the familiar faces Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're seeing that, you know, a lot of those people are going to be coming back to the House of Assembly, but it's going to be a very different looking House of Assembly, especially because it's now a majority. Last time it was a minority. The parties did have to somewhat work together if they wanted to pass any legislation. But this time, Andrew Fury has the seats he needs to implement his agenda. And uh, while he talked about collaboration there, it'll be interesting to see what form that takes because he no longer needs to collaborate in order to get the legislation passed. But from his speech, we know that desire to collaborate is still there. Well, let's get a bit of reaction from a person you're familiar with. You're probably at least familiar with his voice, if not his face. Ramraj Shrenderan is the host of the St. John's Morning Show and 
Uh, you've been talking to all sorts of people throughout the course of the campaign. First of all, I guess, what, what's your reaction to the results here that we're seeing with a Liberal majority government that a lot of people didn't think was possible for? I think it, it's, uh, I don't know if I have a reaction specifically to the result itself. I think what's going to be interesting is going to be hearing from folks in the coming weeks. Because when this election started to the last couple of weeks have been two kind of elections. The last few weeks we've seen an election about an election. And then prior to that, we saw the actual issues. And it's, it's going to be uh, interesting to see people kind of uh, reminded of some of those issues from early on and kind of look for that accountability from the leader. So right now, you know, I think it's going to be a, a big uh big a set of like responsibility and accountability on Fury's plate. You know, he said he wanted a majority to do what he needed to do. And throughout this election, people had a lot of questions on some of the priorities they had, whether it was the economy, whether it was health care or retention. And they're going to be really trying to hold his feet to the fire here, really trying to see if he's going to come through, because throughout this election, they weren't getting uh, the clear picture, those details that they were asking for. Yeah, when you talk about that clear picture, a lot of buzzwords in his speech about great things he's going to do. There's going to be collaboration. There's going to be a bold vision. There's going to be the things we need to do. But he, the actual campaign that he ran on didn't have a lot of bold things in the platform. It was a pretty, you know, very few new spending promises, no talks of any cuts. Uh, so you know, how, how do you think he needs to navigate going from that position to some of that bold vision that he talked about? Well, people were hungry for answers throughout, whether it was the experts, the academics or other politicians, uh, former politicians, mostly the voters, really like they didn't need to be experts in the field to know the state of the economy. They were living it. They either lost their jobs, know somebody who did, had to pivot their lifestyles. And they were telling us these stories. And so they wanted the details. They wanted to know their leaders were going to, or their future leaders were going to have answers and scope into what the details were, what the impacts they were feeling. They wanted to know the nitty gritty and how it was going to be decisively dealt with. Now we have this report that we haven't seen yet. I think folks are going to be really curious about that. There's a lot of vague answers that were given by candidates because the, the, the voters really didn't feel satisfied. They weren't satiated by any of these answers. And so they're going to be really looking for those details as we go on. Even after this majority win, I think a lot of folks were kind of hoping for a bit more detail on that speech. Uh, but it's really going to be telling in the coming weeks after we get past any potential challenges that come through what's what's in the report? What, what are these big decisions that we're going to see? How are you going to move forward from this situation so we don't repeat or have history repeat itself? Interesting perspective. Thanks so much, Ramraj, for uh, joining us. And I'm sure you'll have lots of great reaction on the St. John's Morning Show coming up Monday morning. Thanks so much, Peter. And one of the questions in this campaign is the number of female MHAs that we're going to have in the House of Assembly. And let's look at the change, and the, the answer is, it's not a change. We're going to have the exact same number of women that we had last time. Nine women elected. Uh, we saw the Liberals added one, but then the NDP, with Alison Coffin losing her seat, goes down one. This is interesting, Carolyn, because this was an election where we had a record number of female candidates, but that didn't turn into a record number of MHAs. Uh, 2015 is the record with 10 MHAs. Still only 25%. Yeah, and, and strong, uh, strong women. Uh, Alison Coffin, you know, leader of the NDP, um, losing her seat there. Um, yeah, it's... It, it, it will lead to some interesting questions, especially because Andrew Fury did run on a campaign when he was running his leadership that he said, I'm not going to only have lots of female candidates, but I'm going to put them in those winnable seats uh, so that, you know, they're not just sacrificial lambs, but we want women who can win. And uh, it didn't lead to a big increase in the number of women in the House of Assembly. Mm -hmm. A lot of the story today, even though it's a liberal majority, is about the PCs and the future of the opposition. Mark Quinn has been following that story from the newsroom because the PCs have not had an event today where they've made their leader available. So, uh, Mark, when are we actually going to expect to be able to ask Chess Crosby some of the many questions we have for him? It doesn't look like it's going to happen today. I spoke with people in the party and they said that uh, they don't think he'll be uh, available today to speak with the media or anyone else uh, today. Uh, they said that could change. They said this election has been odd and ever-changing. They'll let us know if that changes. But right now, uh, Chess Crosby isn't scheduled to speak with anyone uh, today. Uh, I did speak with some people in the party and they're saying that uh, you know the party has fared fairly well. The party's in a good position. 
Uh, the leadership is a question now. Uh, Chess Crosby hasn't said, of course, what he intends to do. Uh, but uh, people in the party are saying, look, uh, there's a majority government that's talking about bold moves and giant steps, and we need a strong opposition to oppose them. And that's what you know democracy requires. Um, so Chess Crosby was great in the House of Assembly. He's a lawyer who has a lot of experience asking questions in court, and we saw that in the House of Assembly. People are wondering if he'll be there again to fulfill that role in the future. And uh, people are wondering, you know, if he isn't, uh, there should be someone doing it quickly because things are going to happen fast this uh, spring, I think. And I think, think a lot of people expect that changes are coming uh, with the next budget and with Muscat Falls, of course, and the economic situation of this province. So uh, people are wondering now what happens to the opposition, Peter. And it was interesting that even during the campaign, we saw one of the uh, candidates sort of floating the idea that he might be interested in the leadership. That was Chris Tibbs. Uh, so I guess there'll be some follow-up questions now for Mr. Tibbs. Yes, and uh, his, his name has come up, and uh, yeah, I guess he's one of the people who people have talked about. Tony Wakem's another one. Uh, you know, Dave Brazel's been around a long time. Uh, there are a number of people uh, who, who could uh, be the interim leader or maybe even uh, challenged for the leadership. Um, Layla Evans is a great strong voice, uh, Leila Evans. Um, she has been asked about this in the past and she said she wasn't interested in leadership. Uh, a lot of people are very strongly uh, supporting her. Uh, so all kinds of people with all kinds of experience now. Um, but I think people are saying it has to happen fairly quickly because uh, we need, as I said earlier, a strong opposition now, Peter. Well, thanks very much, Mark, for keeping on this story for us. And uh, there'll be lots more questions in the coming days. Thanks, Peter. It's the loneliest election I've ever covered, all alone here in the newsroom, but uh, it's been an interesting one for sure. We will just add that to the very long list of how this election was different from any other election, but it is unusual because normally any time I can remember, the leaders of at least the three main parties have always been available in a ballroom somewhere. They've done a speech. They've answered questions. We got the pre-recorded speech, but uh, we're going to have to wait, sounds like maybe even days, to hear some of those questions. And here's another thing that is unlike any other election that we've had, the low voter turnout. <laughs> Just 48%. Yep, so this is the first time then that fewer than half of the eligible voters have actually cast a ballot in this election. Uh, you know, one of the questions for Andrew Fury will be what this does to the legitimacy. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, not the lowest voter turnout ever, but he did get 86,000 people voting for him in this election race. Yeah, and just those total numbers here. Uh, so 48%, 178,632 people uh, voted in this election out of 372,037. Yeah, so a lot of people either choosing to stay home because they were frustrated by how this election kept changing or they were one of the people who tried and wasn't able to get a ballot on the last day. We heard a lot of people as the website crashed and the phone lines were full. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, there are not a lot of races that are really super tight where you're seeing, you know, 50 is the tightest race. So how do these irregularities um, play in? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. And interesting how uh, Torngat Mountains is the lowest turnout there. Uh, you know, in Labrador, we've heard a lot of stories up there about even translating ballots uh, has been an issue. Uh, and also internet connection, even access to postal services uh, in those areas. Some of the, the postal services uh, closed a, a little bit earlier in the day and made it a little, a little bit challenging for people to get their votes in. In Torngat mountains just 22 percent of the people actually cast a ballot and this is you know it's an area where a lot of people don't speak English as their mm -hmm. first language the remoteness that you were talking about so all of those are barriers uh, that people were facing there and yeah so how much of it was just they were fed up with this election because I know plenty of people that I talked to um, they, they, they just wanted to put this all behind them. Ten weeks was too long to be talking about an election and they just got tired and threw their hands up. But how many of those are people who wanted, tried yeah. and weren't able to? And how many of those votes are still in the mail, perhaps? And, and that's going to be one of the follow-up questions. We did actually put in a request to speak to Bruce Chalk, the, the Chief Electoral Officer for Newfoundland and Labrador, the man who ran this election, who changed the dates five times, and we were told that he would not be doing interviews today. But one person who is doing interviews is Andrew Fury, the Premier with the new majority mandate, and he is at the ballroom in downtown St. John's, and he's joining us now. Premier, first of all, congratulations on your win. 
Thanks, Peter. You mentioned in your speech there a lot of talk about uh, bold visions, difficult choices. When are we actually going to see what that actually translates into in terms of policy? Well, you know, some of it is we've already released throughout the election campaign, uh, where we, whether we were talking about bold, aggressive targets on immigration and reimagining our population uh, to, re to reverse the demographic crisis that we're facing. Uh, we need to fix Muskrat Falls uh, so that we can deal with the structural issues of, from the economy in the medium term. So those are just some examples of the, of the vision that we want to put forward. But this is a real opportunity that we embrace new sectors and, and frankly recognize and, and maximize the value of them and their synergies with other sectors. So what I mean by that is, for, is by example, an investment in technology could easily be an investment in our fishery and our offshore oil and gas embracing new renewable energies that we know we have an abundance of here now. Now is the time as we emerge from this disruption to really reinvent and reimagine who we want to be. We heard earlier in the show, uh, Carolyn Stokes had a great package of all the premiers who faced similar challenges, fiscal challenges, and the beating that they took by the public. Are you ready to take a beating if it, you think it's the right thing to do? Look, I don't think it's about be being beaten. I think that these are decisions that collectively we all have to own, and I think the public are intelligent, the electorate are intelligent, they understand the issues we face, and we are going to do this together. So this is not be by beating up on me. I mean, what, what purpose does that serve? We need to make these decisions together so, so we can really recognize the full value, which I think we all know we have here, for an optimistic future for Newfoundland and Labrador. But there are always going to be people, whenever you're making big changes, who aren't happy with those changes. Absolutely. That's, that's the nature of life. But what we need to do is make sure that the general public understands the decisions, why we're making them. And I believe that they're intelligent and have the ca capacity and capability to understand what decisions we need to make. And in consultations with them, we will make them. We will set that new map forward. This is uncharted territory. And I think we can do it, but we can only do it together. One of the things your party was able to do is defeat both of the leaders of the other parties. What was it like seeing those results come in? Uh, well, you know, I, I know it's, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie, I was happy to see the, the majority uh, victory, uh, ecstatic, um, uh, to see Mr. Crosby and Mr. Coffin, uh, sorry, Ms. Coffin uh, lose their seats. Um, you know, we said this was an election on leadership, and I think uh, part of it speaks to that. But part of it speaks to the fact that we put forward, I think, a, a more optimistic, hopeful style of campaign and platform moving forward, and the people uh, understood that, uh, recognized that, and voted for it. In the last legislature, you had to work with other parties because you had a minority. You talked about in your speech there about continuing a collaborative approach. What does that look like when you don't necessarily need those other parties to vote for your legislation in order to make it pass? Well, I've said that we needed a unified front moving forward. I look forward to working with other parties, looking forward to working with their leaders and, and trying to craft the narrative that we can push forward. Uh, this is, this, like I said the, from the previous answer, this is not about me. It's not about liberal issues or progressive conservative issues or NDP issues. These are issues facing Newfoundland and Labrador. And if we all put the province first, we'll all make the right decisions for the right reasons. So I'm looking forward to working with, with everybody, regardless of political uh, color. If you have bright, reasonable ideas that can propel the province forward, I'm certainly uh, happy to work with you. Well, Andrew Fury, congratulations, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Have a great day. And that is Andrew Fury. He is re-elected as Premier in Newfoundland and Labrador, 22 seats, giving him that majority. He's going to have 13 seats for the PCs, three independents, and two new Democrats. Carolyn, as we wrap up here... Some final thoughts on what we've seen here uh, in this afternoon election. <laughs> yes, uh, it's been a long, bumpy road, uh, but it appears it was worth it for Andrew Fury. He has his majority. Um, some really interesting things happened uh, this afternoon. Two party leaders uh, taken out. We have the lowest vo voter turnout in the province's history. More independents in the House now than NDP. So it's been quite an interesting, surprising afternoon. Yeah, and it, I think a lot of the questions are what do the PCs and what do the NDP look like when the dust settles on their parties? 
their leaders don't have seats. That makes it a very difficult situation. Andrew Fury, if he resumes the House, because we know they're going to have to sit very soon to pass a budget or at very least pass interim supply so the money keeps flowing for the province to keep going, but he's not going to have those two leaders there in question period. It's going to be other MHAs. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, that makes life a little bit easier for him, uh, that the parties are going to have to spend a lot of time focusing on themselves and how they rebuild uh, rather than focusing on him and some of the policies. So it'll be interesting to see how he's able to use that. And will there be court challenges, I wonder? Particularly in Alison Coffin's case, uh, with such a small margin, she did talk about court challenges uh, when in her speech. So. And we saw in the lead up, they had plenty of concerns over too many ballots being thrown out and counted as spoiled. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, and I think that's going to be one of the big questions out of this is court challenges. Are any of these races close enough? When the parties take a look at those irregularities, do they think it's enough for any of these results to change, for them to be willing to spend the time, effort, and money in order to do it? Mm -hmm. Well, Carolyn, thanks so much Thank for you, all Peter. of your insights and taking us through all these districts as we tell the story of the Newfoundland and Labrador election for 2021. Well, it has been a long campaign filled with twists and turns. We had COVID outbreaks and lockdowns, but it has now all come to an end. We now know that Andrew Fury got the majority. He will be leading Newfoundland and Labrador. It'll be his job to tackle the big economic and fiscal challenges facing the province. But the story doesn't end here though. With those voting problems and irregularities, there are going to be questions about the legitimacy of the vote. We're going to be following all of those developments in the weeks and maybe even months ahead. We'll have to see how it goes. It's also going to be a lot of talk of, do we need to change elections in this province? Change the way we do them, modernize the situation in light of the problems here. Well, on behalf of myself and my co-host, Carolyn Stokes, as well as our team of reporters and amazing producers behind the scenes, thanks for being with us, for spending part of your Saturday. We'll be back to cover the fallout on Here and Now on Monday. Have a great weekend.